Chihuahua was delighted to see that Vikir had arrived through the main door this time, instead of the window like before. But as he stood near the window, Vikir was bothered about something. He wanted to know why there were so many people gathered outside from where they were. The local citizens of the town had gathered happily, holding banners filled with heart shapes and showering Vikir with words of praise. Our boy has now officially become some sort of K-pop idol. Chihuahua explains that the news about his return had spread throughout the empire, and that everyone came here to welcome him back. Vikir could only comment that it was annoying while holding his head as the door to the room opened suddenly. Our dear sweet angel, Pomerian had arrived, shouting at Vikir and calling him daddy. As he patted her head, he told her to call him uncle instead of daddy, but she was too excited. Holding something within her tiny hands, Pomerian tells Vikir to look at what it is. She happily announces to everyone that she had caught a mouse. Vikir looks at it and warns her that even though it was a cute rodent, since it was dead, she needed to be careful to not catch the Black Death. He then moves on to ask Chihuahua about whether the problems within Underdog City had been resolved. He reports to Vikir that thanks to Cindy, they had all been resolved successfully. He even mentions that she was an excellent worker, but as he opens the drawer of the table, he informs Vikir that there was a case that even Cindy couldn't find any leads on. Catching Vikir's attention, placing an envelope onto the table labeled F10, Chihuahua reports that in recent years, children from the slums have been going missing one after the other. The children hadn't been kidnapped since no one had contacted the parents, and they hadn't been seen on the black market. So they couldn't figure out the motive behind the abductions of the children. All the children had disappeared without a trace, so it definitely wasn't the monsters. But although there isn't any physical evidence, Chihuahua was sure that it was done by the same person. After reading the report that Chihuahua had given him, Vikir's face was immediately filled with dread as he gripped the papers tightly in his hand. The children's disappearance case of the underdog city, was exactly similar to what he was framed with in his past life. But he was confused as this event was supposed to happen several years later. Since he knew that this case was related to something else. But as they were discussing the case, Pomerian shouts at them to look at her. She proudly shows off the dead mouse from before, who stood healthy and alive on her arm this time. Pomerian had brought it back from the dead leaving Vikir and Chihuahua in a state of shock and confusion as they were stunned by what was happening. So he asks her if she had really brought the mouse back to life. She happily tells them that she did with a bright smile on her face. Looking at her playing with the once dead mouse, Vikir thought about how he was now certain that she had brought it back to life, making him wonder if it was voodooism, which uses mana from another dimension. So then, he asks Pomerian about when she discovered that she could do such a thing, with her tiny hands, she started to count back the number of nights, and ended with three nights ago. She reveals to Vikir that simply copied what her tribe's people did. Hearing that, a nervous sweat drop drips down his face as Vikir thought about how one of the Lokoko tribe's villages found Pomerian, which made him think that they had acquired black and evil spirit magic. In the Baskerville and Morg clan, which are known for their geniuses, children need to be at least eight years old to use magic. But compared to them, our little angel, Pomerian, who is five years old, is able to use another dimension's mana which is difficult to sense. A magical genius from the Baskerville family, more specifically, a black magic genius at that. Vikir could only think of Hugo's completely enraged face once he found out about this. He believes that Hugo would call for her immediate execution, knowing that she uses black magic and has barbarian blood too. Thinking that he knew Hugo well, Vikir believed that it would be best for Pomerian and Hugo to never meet one another. As he thought about it, Chihuahua appeared near the window just as a pigeon arrived. Turns out, the pigeon was used to deliver a message on a note. Looking at it instantly brought shock to Chihuahua's face as he read it. He immediately calls out to Vikir, telling him that it was bad. Chihuahua's words started to come out in pieces as he read out the contents of the letter, revealing something from the main house. Unable to understand his words, Vikir tells Chihuahua to speak slowly and calmly. After catching his breath, Chihuahua reveals that the Patriarch was coming here in person. And so, Hugo makes his appearance. The scene changes to cups of tea placed on the table. Chihuahua stood behind Vikir as Barrymore does the same but behind Hugo. Father and son continued to simply stare at one another as time went by while the room was dead silent. Hugo was the first to speak, stating the fact that Vikir had returned. Chihuahua was glad that they had finally spoken. Looking around, Vikir thought about how sudden it was for Hugo to come here, and that luckily, he hid Pomerian in the next room so hopefully nothing happens. 
Hugo was glad to see that Vikir had returned, so he wanted to know what he had been up to till now. Vikir reveals to Hugo that while wandering the forest, he stayed with the barbarians and focused on recovering his injuries. During that time, he pretended to be friendly and had gotten a grasp on the barbarians, so he was able to think of a way to wipe them out. Hugo was curious to know what Vikir planned to do, so he revealed it to him. Controlling the barbarians by utilizing the Empire's industrial products. He further tells Hugo that the barbarians consider the Empire's cheap glass orbs and woolen products, and even vegetables and grains as precious items. So if they use that to their advantage, then they would be able to capture the barbarians effectively. But Hugo wasn't impressed by this, calling Vikir's idea as trading and not suppressing them. Hearing this, Vikir corrects him by stating that the barbarians will die in the process. With his eyes glowing with a mad red light, Vikir reveals that in exchange for the products, he was planning to request a monster subjugation. Hugo thought about Vikir's idea of making the barbarians subjugate the monsters, so that they can secure their own territory while killing the barbarians off. Like father, like son, the same red glow appears in Hugo's eyes as he grins widely. Calling Vikir's idea clever, which was to be expected from his son. As they continued to discuss Vikir's idea, Chihuahua couldn't help but sweat nervously while thinking that this was a conversation between a father and son who had just been reunited. Barrymore on the other hand noticed something else, Hugo was smiling. He recalled that he hadn't seen him smile at all during the two years that Vikir had disappeared in. While taking a sip of his drink, Vikir thought about how he didn't want the Balak people to suffer because of the Baskerville family. From the Baskerville's perspective, it would seem like the natives are dying as they are clearing up the monsters. But in reality, they're just returning to the place where the madam was. While stopping the battle between the two of them, the Baliks will have the time to increase their forces. Hugo, who doesn't know about the madam's existence, would think that the natives will easily agree to this. Without realizing that his enemy, the natives of the forest, are increasing their powers. But Hugo was pissed off by something all of a sudden, catching Vikir's attention. The liquid inside the cup started to boil suddenly, as Hugo unleashed a powerfully aura filled with hatred. Announcing to everyone that they will not trade with the Lokoko tribe. As he reveals that he was going to annihilate that tribe, Vikir agreed to Hugo's intentions, while being taken back by his rageful aura from earlier, as he didn't expect Hugo to still have a grudge against the Lokoko tribe, which is more of the reason why he shouldn't let him meet Pomerian. Hugo had finally regained his composure after a while, realizing that he had only been talking about the barbarians since meeting his son that he lost contact with for a long time. He then tells Vikir to not go overboard in the front lines again. Revealing that after he had saved the morgue's daughter and went missing, the Baskervilles were able to obtain a great diplomatic benefit from the morgues. Even the Imperial family had heard about this moving story, and have come to think highly of the Baskerville knights. However, to Hugo, who saw himself as Vikir's father, had lost his son, making all of that meaningless. He continues to lecture Vikir that obtaining things in exchange for losing a child is worthless, so he shouldn't overdo it from now on. Hearing those kind words, Vikir could only think of them as a pretense. Before his regression, the night he escaped after being framed, the feeling of being stabbed in the back, literally, and the cold stares from the bloodhounds whom he shared joys and sorrows with. Vikir could tell in an instant that he was abandoned by his master. Hugo didn't even give him a chance to explain himself, so Vikir was sure that his fangs wouldn't become dull because of his pretense. As lightning strikes the land, Vikir thanks Hugo for his worries while wearing a cold look on his face. A loud wailing sound is heard as Pomerian's voice rings throughout the room, calling out for uncle. Her sudden appearance instantly casted fear into Vikir's and Chihuahua's faces as they realized. Pomerian casually runs past Hugo and Barrymore, complaining to Vikir about the rain and the loudness of the thunder and how it went bang-bang. She quickly hugs Vikir, telling him about how scary it was. Vikir started to panic as he shifted his gaze from Pomerian to Hugo, knowing that he couldn't let the both of them meet. But as he stares at Hugo, his eyes widen at a shocking scene in front of them. Hugo was standing up straight with a darkened expression on his face, as he looked closely at Pomerian his face was filled with confusion over how she looked. The master of the iron-blooded Baskerville family, one of the seven families of the Great Rock Empire, Hugo Le Baskerville. He chased the barbarians far away from the border, he is also the empire's strongest sword saint, who has killed hundreds of monsters. Once he makes a decision, he doesn't change his mind, and he is known to be a man with iron blood. But right now, the man who has iron, Hugo, 
his emotions had begun to fluctuate for the first time in a long time. As Pomerian continued to hold tightly onto Vikir's shirt, screaming out that the thunder was scary, Hugo could see the reflection of her daughter's face within her. As he called out the name Penelope, Pomerian finally looked up to Hugo, only to be frightened even more as she hid her face in Vikir's chest, shouting out loud that the mustache man was scary. Seeing Hugo's reaction to Pomerian, Vikir tells him to calm down. He explained to Hugo that he had brought Pomerian here so that he could order her around. He reveals that he saw her red eyes and thought she was one of them, but after looking into it, she was from one of the tribes at the borders. So he didn't believe that she was a family member. Hearing that, Hugo started to regain his composure. He felt a bit off and agreed that he was mistaken for a moment. As there was no way that his daughter, Penelope, would be that young if she were alive. Hugo decided to leave first, informing Vikir that he was tired. A nervous sweat drop drips down Vikir's face as he tells Hugo to have a safe journey back. But deep within his mind, Vikir couldn't believe that Hugo, who possesses the soul of a swordmaster, was that shaken up, which meant that Vikir was right that something was up. Before leaving, Hugo calls out to Vikir as his son, telling him to attend tomorrow's grand banquet. Chihuahua hears that and knows that Hugo was referring to the dinner where only a select few of his closest descendants gather, it was the dream of all Baskerville members to attend that banquet. Vikir agrees to Hugo's request, and tells him that he would see him tomorrow night. But before leaving, Hugo couldn't help himself and stole one final look towards Pomerian, who was crying within Chihuahua's arms. We now turn to Vikir resting back at home, instead of sleeping on his comfortable bed, he chose the floor. Late in the night, he was still wide awake, thinking that even after taking a hot shower and laying on a soft bed, it all felt so foreign to him that he couldn't sleep. He wonders if this was the effect of living with the Balak warriors for two years, as it seems like his body won't get used to this for a while. As he thought about today's events, he found Hugo's reaction to be quite unexpected. He even thought about whether to report to him about Pomerian and the pendant or not, but after seeing his reaction today, Vikir had made his decision. After tomorrow's grand banquet, he was going to feel Hugo out. As Pomerian might become a good trump card which will lead to Hugo's downfall. But no matter what happens, Vikir needs to make sure that Pomerian doesn't get affected. Vikir's eyes were finally closed after a while as a light breeze entered his room. Followed by a dark figure standing near the window, Vikir immediately sensed its presence as his eyes opened wide. The dark figure took out a blade and stood in front of Vikir's bed. But before the figure could do anything, Vikir commented out loud that it hasn't even been a day, and yet the information has already spread so fast, alarming the intruder. Our boy immediately leaps onto the bed with one arm while priming himself to kick the shit out of the intruder. Vikir manages to leg sweep the knife out of the intruder's hand, sending it flying into the nearby wall. But before he could end the intruder's life with his fingers, the intruder shouts at him to wait. Damn, let's all take a moment to look at our boy's veins. Now back to the story. The intruder continues to tell Vikir that it was a joke, looking closer to the masked figure. Vikir realizes who it was. He informs the friend that next time, come after requesting an audience, otherwise it would have been bad if he killed by mistake. The masked figure still found Vikir's strange habit of disguising his pillow as himself and sleeping on the floor, kind of weird. As the masked figure removed their mask, they commented that Vikir still hasn't changed even after coming back from the dead. Whoa, it turns out to be Cindy. After revealing herself, Vikir warns him to not make a scene but she simply sticks her tongue out as a reply. As she walked towards the bed, she asked Vikir if the reason why he sent Chihuahua after her was to check whether she had taken the $10 billion. Vikir revealed that he knew of her ability to increase the wealth of capitalist and build trust and to eventually, waste it all. Which he took account of. But as she sat down on the bed, Cindy called him rude for thinking that way about her since she was only a financial planner who receives commissions. She even claims that without her, then Judy would have lost the $10 billion he had given her. This was when Vikir revealed that he had assigned bodyguards to Judy to prevent such a thing from happening. And amongst the bodyguards he assigned, one of them was a finance expert, whose job was to filter out the bad guys. Hearing about this, Cindy was surprised to see that those bodyguards didn't mess with her at all. Vikir tells her that it was because he ordered them not to approach her at all. Cindy couldn't believe that she had been dancing in Vikir's palm from the beginning. But as Vikir wore his shirt back on, he wanted to know if she had the information he requested. Cindy immediately unzips her outfit, telling Vikir that she had brought it. As she handed the scroll over to him, 
Our boy was phased by how her personality had changed since two years ago and wanted her to submit the reports in a folder instead. Since she fulfilled her mission, Vikir agreed to her request of joining on the trade with the natives. Hearing about the reward, Cindy decided that she should call Vikir, boss from now on. Looking at the report that Cindy had given, Vikir could see that it was the information regarding the people attending tomorrow's banquet, he also knew that he would have been invited to the grand banquet as long as he made a great contribution. The first report was about Hugo Le Baskerville, showing his rank as patriarch, status as marquis, and his military prestige as swordmaster. But Vikir knew almost everything about Hugo, so he decided to skip this part of the report. Moving on, something catches his attention. He could see that Boston Terrier and Great Dame were attending the banquet as well. Boston Terrier Le Baskerville, rank as the commander of the Pitbull Order Senator. Status as Count and Military Prestige as the highest-ranked graduator. A side note about him is that he is Hugo Le Baskerville's half-brother. Does not like to be restrained and is quite aggressive and short-tempered. Next up is Great Dame Le Baskerville, who holds the rank of commander of the Mastiff Order Senator. Status as Count and Military Prestige as the highest-ranked graduator. A side note about him is that he is also Hugo Le Baskerville's half-brother. Although he tries not to get involved with others, he is on bad terms with Count Boston Terrier. Looking at the report, Vikir wonders why these two people who don't attend internal house events would be attending this one. Cindy replies that it was probably because they wanted to meet the young legend of the Baskerville clan who came back from the dead. And they probably wanted to take Vikir into their own orders. Hearing that from her, Vikir could sense that it was going to be an exhausting day for him tomorrow. Next on the report is Osiris Le Baskerville, ranked as a member of the lower house, his status as Viscount with the military prestige as the highest-ranked graduator. A side note is that he is Hugo Le Baskerville's eldest son and is currently ranked first in line for succession. Cindy reveals more information that the eldest son who is growing up to become the spitting image of Hugo ever since he was younger has obtained the swordsmanship at the level of the Seven Counts. He had also been evaluated to reach the level of Swordmaster soon. Vikir thought about the time before he regressed, he had seen Osiris from afar a few times. He was a cold and reserved person who doesn't even greet his own subordinates, let alone his younger siblings of the direct bloodline. Knowing this, Cindy was curious about who was stronger, Osiris who's the strongest within the Baskerville clan excluding the Patriarch and the Seven Counts, or the main character Vikir. We all know the answer to that right. But instead of answering her, Vikir warns her to not try and grasp their combat abilities. Next on the list was someone who Vikir thought was in the middle of isolation training, but instead was coming back to attend the Grand Banquet. It was someone named Seth Le Baskerville, ranked as the Underdog City's Consul, member of the Lower House, he holds the status of Shadow Count and has the military prestige mid-ranked graduator. A side note is that he is Hugo Le Baskerville's second son and is currently second in line for succession. Compared to his older brother, his talent in swordsmanship is lacking and he was rather weak from a young age. His personality isn't like the other Baskervilles. He is gentle and kind. When he was younger, he was persecuted by Hugo for being weak. The bloodhounds who were dying as though they were trash. He was the only one who cried for them, he was also the only person that Vikir respected in the Baskerville family. Vikir couldn't believe that he was able to meet him at this time. As he looked through the remaining reports, he could see a few familiar faces and immediately placed them down. Surprising Cindy who wondered why he read through the remaining reports briefly as she did her best to investigate them. Vikir tells her it's because he knew who these guys were very well. It's our favorite triplets. With his sinister bloodhound aura activated, Vikir smiles while looking at the reports of everyone. Knowing that with these people around tomorrow at the Grand Banquet, a lot of interesting things will definitely happen. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.